insight and tie to this particular interview. So thank you for that. Before we get thank into you. some of your slides, I, I want to lay up um, another question. So we know that many mm -hmm. essential businesses never stopped working through this crisis, but the rest of the world is beginning mm -hmm. to prepare for the reopening of the economy. Over the last few weeks, OSHA has issued some guidance on several topics, including the identification of high risk occupations, the importance of systematically removing hazards from the workplace through the hierarchy of controls, which is a concept that safety professionals understand well. And lastly, you've issued guidance on enforcement. So can you talk about each of these areas? And I know that you have some slides. So again, I will ask our team to open those now and help you um, talk through it. Great. Um, yeah, I think uh, if you look at them and I can't see what you're seeing, so I'm just gonna go on presuming that you have uh, the first slide, which talks about you know a variety of um, sectors that we've identified that have an increased risk yes, of exposure. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think you can see we've all we've always identified um, uh, you know these operations, uh, especially the critical retail operations, as um, an increased risk. <clears throat> Our risk pyramid is interactive and available online as well, and it's been part of our guidance document since. Um, you know, I guess we put it out in March at this point, but I think it's really imperative for companies, employers to examine the workplace, especially as you're going back in. For folks that have been, you know, uh, engaging every day for the last six to eight weeks, um, they've, they're probably several weeks ahead of folks who are now looking at, okay, I'm going to reopen the doors. Um, you know, what are we going to do here? And I think it's a great opportunity to really do a hazard analysis. And we certainly have folks um, that could weigh in if um, people are looking for uh, consultation. Um, small businesses, especially, I don't think any of you all are super small business, but um, we have our on-site consultation program, which is going to more of an online consultation program at this point, but it never closed its doors. And, um, you know, our compliance assistance folks are also available for people who have questions. Um, I know you all are in the technology sector. Um, somebody raised uh, this morning even that um, folks who are looking at um, large uh, cubicle areas and, you know, bringing people back in, how are they going to do that? We will uh, endeavor to put some more guidance out for some of those kinds of um, workplaces. But um, if you move through our slide um, briefly, the, the occupational exposure, um, here we're talking about um, food processing, manufacturing, construction. Uh, we just put out our um, meat packing guidance yesterday afternoon that we worked with um, our federal partners at CDC. And um, I think that's another area I would like to emphasize. We're not doing this in a vacuum. Um, we're doing a lot of this with consultation between our folks um, at NIOSH and um, the folks at CDC. So we were very fortunate to already have a great relationship with them, but uh, this has really been a joint effort um, to get a lot of this material out. And so um, if you move on, we have um, sort of outlined the exposure risk for very high exposure which I don't believe your folks no. really fall into. No. This is our, um, our healthcare workers, which we've really been a priority for us to address um, what has been going on in the healthcare setting. It certainly was um, at the forefront when we went into this, um, recognizing the challenges that they were going to face. Um, but when you move into the um, you know, sort of medium risk exposures here, um, I think you can see some of the other, uh, it goes back to some of the retail um, pieces. Mm -hmm. But I think what you really want to get to is um, the slide that starts with our OSHA guidance document. And um, mm -hmm. we have a larger document um, that we put out as we went into the COVID pandemic. And um, I think it provides a lot of um, evergreen material for folks to examine as they are looking at going back to work. We are um, going to try to put together a guidance document for return to work. I think there's a 
lot of recommendations that are being made by a variety of um, federal partners and state agencies. And we're getting questions about how those intersect with existing OSHA regulations. And so we're trying to put some um, really good, careful thought into how the interaction works so that when people are um, headed back to work, they have our um, best thinking on this subject. So Lauren, so we also you're... have, yeah. Let me just jump in really quick, just so everyone knows. Um, and you as well. We do have small businesses on this call as well. So, oh, great. Okay. So have, it's a wide range, but we have startups to large entities. Super. Um, well, our on site consultation program is certainly available to the smaller folks. Um, and you can find information on that through our website as well. Mm -hmm. um, we can make sure we get you all the appropriate links of the things that I'm talking about here. Um, but our OSHA guidance is even beyond the one document that we put together early on. Um, as you've seen, we've got industry sectors, we have our safety and health topics page, and then um, we have all the other guidance documents that we have put out um, and our enforcement um, guidance documents as well. Um, so I think if you're working through the slides, the next one um, is the um, risk pyramid. Uh, which like we just sort of talked through, um, you know, examining what the um, worker interaction is daily with the public, if it's consistent, if it's constant, you're gonna wanna take um, other steps than if it's intermittent or non-existent. And so it's really examining what your folks are doing on a daily basis, um, whether it's uh, sitting in a cubicle or interacting with the public and having an idea of what the hazards are and how to um, address those. But the most important thing, um, which is really some of the most simple things that we can be doing, and I think everybody's heard this uh, repeatedly. So our next slide, it's um, really um, hygiene, good hygiene, um, good <laughs> respiratory etiquette. I think everybody has uh, heard this sort of repeatedly on the news. Um, but it, it's even more important now, especially if you have high frequency contact with the public, that um, folks are encouraged to continually wash their hands and um, where hand washing facilities aren't readily available, uh, you know, having alcohol based sanitizer is another hand sanitizer is another important aspect. But um, certainly hand washing and frequency will be um, a key element. Uh, so the next slide talks about um, regularly disinfecting and following um, you know the EPA approved cleaning um, disinfection products they have uh, the EPA has a list of products that they believe are um, helpful in this area and so we refer folks back to that um, in our information but um, if you keep going on uh, you know we have this uh, discussion of talking to workers about their risk of COVID. And I think if you want to sort of go back even to what we were just talking about with safe and sound, um, talking to your workers and trying to reduce the um, fear factor is going to be a huge element of this return to work. And I think if employers can say, hey, we have examined um, our work practices and here's what we think we're going to do to address them. Um, those will be very important uh, for your own uh, sort of well-being of your workers um, as we go forward. Uh, folks are um, asking us constantly about what um, kinds of standards we're looking at uh, and what, you know, worker training is out there for folks that would need um, personal protective equipment. Uh, there's obviously an OSHA regulation in place for that. And for folks who would have respiratory protection requirements, uh, there's a series of things that an employer would have to do to ensure you're in um, compliance with our respiratory protection um, standard. So um, moving on, so we have the existing standards, which we've just sort of covered, which is the blue box um, on the right. Mm -hmm. And then I think another topic that people are interested in, and then we can take other questions if you want, is yeah. um, the area of OSHA enforcement. Um, so we've been primarily focused early on, I think folks saw 
on um, trying to ensure access to respirators, especially in the healthcare setting. Um, the president directed us to examine all ways that we could ensure uh, respiratory protection was available. And um, we have done a series of four or five things in this area. So we've allowed for flexibility with the annual fit test. Um, the initial fit test is still a requirement and very important to make sure that workers who need respiratory protection um, have properly uh, done the test so you know that the respirator you're wearing is the right one and would protect you from um, infection. But we've then allowed um, the use of international respirators and um, respirators beyond the manufactured use by date uh, based on science from our uh, colleagues at NIOSH. So those are some of the key elements that have taken place related to respirators. But as far as other things that um, we are doing. I think folks have seen, we put our enforcement um, guidance document out of um, sort of our uh, priorities, if you will. So our folks are responding to almost 3,000 complaints at this point just on COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, outside of that, we've closed about half of those. Um, our folks are unfortunately still responding to fatalities in this environment and um, you know, we're on the ground for a variety of imminent dangers. Um, a, a week ago, one of our folks had to go um, to a construction site and pulled you know, workers out of an unsure trench. So it, we haven't shut down, which um, I think is a myth that's out there. And um, we're going to look um, you know, very carefully at what people are doing and how they're working um, to ensure that their uh, their employees are protected, and where we find you know dramatic failures, we're going to enforce. Uh, nothing's changed in um, you know sort of our standards and what's required, uh, but there has been a you know huge challenge, and um, in a lot of areas. So I may stop there and um, see Great. if you all have other specific questions. We do. So Jonathan, you want to take great. some of the questions? Yeah, we've got a great number of questions coming in from our, our chat room here and appreciate uh -oh. taking the time <laughs> to answer them. Now, we'll get through them, but some of them we may not be able to get okay. to at the time. But I guess first and foremost, we came up very early in the conversation um, is addressing liability concerns uh, as people come back to work through you know, properly using monitoring technologies and having the correct uh, PPE gear and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to stipulate that I'm not an attorney and I'm not giving legal advice. That's fine. <laughs> um, what I am going to say <laughs> is, um, you know, folks just need, for, for the OSHA context, folks need to look at what our existing regulations are and, um, you know, what were they doing pre-COVID and what do they need to do post-COVID um, to protect their workers. So as I said, you know, doing an analysis um, identifying what you think the um, hazards are, that's going to go a long way to um, protecting you and your workers. There's a lot of talk about a lot of things related to quote unquote liability, um, but that's not, not really our um, wheelhouse, right? It's, it's adherence to our standards. And so the more folks can do that, uh, better off everybody's going to be, but ultimately my message to you would be if you have a question that's specific to your work site um, or your workplace, uh, we have compliance assistance folks that can offer um, advice and assistance and, um, you know, our lines are open, as they like to say. <laughs> we love it. We have other questions, Jonathan. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we already talked about the fact that you do have this guidance. That was a question. Um, so here's a big one. This one's pretty tough to answer, but we'll, we'll get it out there and just start to see here because everyone's really antsy to get back to work. Um, any thoughts about when tech-based businesses that are basically around desk jobs will be uh, on deck to return to the blessed sanctity of our offices? <laughs> Uh, a lot of that is at your state and local level, right? So um, depending on, well, you all are mostly Pennsylvania, right? Uh, it's yes. going to be based on, um, you know, what your um, state uh, governor is saying, uh, I guess it's really Commonwealth, sorry, um, about, 
uh, when it is time to come back to work. And I think the more thinking that your folks can do prior to opening the doors about do we have enough hand sanitizer stations in place? Um, you know, we have a top 10 poster of things that you should think about or you should do um, related to uh, working even now. So that might be a resource you could put up and um, it's simple. And I know it seems, um, you know, so simple. Well, of course we could put up a poster, but it's, you know, reminding people about respiratory etiquette, reminding people about washing their hands. Um, in, in your areas, it may be not sharing equipment. Um, you know, there's a lot of touch, um, high touch areas with what you all are doing. So having, uh, you know, hand, um, well, it's not hand sanitizer at that point, but having disinfecting wipes that, you know, are EPA uh, level kinds of things. Those are the kinds of things you all are going to have to look at because I'm sure um, sharing space with telework and things like that is um, one of the benefits of the, um, of the environment that you're in, but you're probably going to want to look at not letting people share laptops and phones and um, things that they're, you know, again, it's the high touch part of it. And that's uh, something that I think folks should really take a good hard look at. It's in our guidance too of, um, you know, some of those kinds of things that people should be examining. Another question, Jonathan? I, yes. I, I saw one about where do they get hand sanitizers right now? Yeah. Yeah. I, there's a nice I, yeah. yeah. Right? Any that's a challenge. <laughs> Right. Uh, we, ha we have had a very interesting dialogue with um, some of the distillers. <laughs> and um, so mm -hmm. the distilleries are looking to help um, fill this gap by using alcohol that they have to create hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, coming from a distillery near you, maybe some hand sanitizer, okay. but they're trying to get those uh, things in the market. So I think it shows a lot of innovation on the part of um, American companies that they said, hmm, you know, we've got a lot of fill in the blank kind of liquor here. Uh, what could we do with it to really help the population? And that's, that's what they've turned to. Okay. There's a question, Jonathan. From yeah, how about from Howard Ween. Um, um, have you heard uh, news reports that several major food processors have been shut down throughout the uh, country, either by state agencies or OSHA? Um, what plans uh, does OSHA have to make sure the nation's food supply is not compromised by the pandemic, um, by potential sure. contamination by affected workers, et cetera? Sure. Um, yes, we have heard that. We have multiple inspections um, open in this area, so I probably can't comment too much on those. Um, but as I said, the, um, we issued our meatpacking guidance yesterday afternoon. So we're hoping that that document will help um, these large and, you know, small um, food processors uh, examine their workspaces and um, see what they can and should be doing to protect these workers. But I will say, yes, we're acutely aware and we do have multiple open um, inspections in this area. Okay, another question. Yeah, um, let me see here as we look through the list. Um, are, there, are there any restrictions on foreign travel that we should be thinking about right now and those being lifted or accentuated? Yeah, so this is going to be a little out of my lane, but I would encourage you to go to the State Department website because I think the State Department early on was providing um, travel advisory guidance for folks and uh, continue to do so. Right. Come on. Yeah. So we have another question. Here's yeah, a good one. Face coverings. Can you ask yeah. that question about face coverings? Can face coverings as bandanas, um, et cetera, fall under the Respiratory Protection Act? Oh, for um, PPE? Right. We are going to, um, we're working with our colleagues at CDC, and we're going to have guidance on that, um, hopefully in the next 24 hours. Wow. And I think that will answer all the questions um, related to that because we uh, obviously we're aware that um, a lot of um, state and localities have started requiring this um, right. out in public. And so we won't be addressing the 
public piece as much as um, the uh, worker employer piece, but we are planning to get some um, information out for folks on that very quickly. Very cool. I'm a bandana man. I think they look the best. No, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So somebody oh, in our office so has have, an Eagles uh, Super Bowl one. So, <laughs> so I have one last question for you. So, from a historical okay. perspective, jobs in Pittsburgh used to be far more dangerous and deadly than they are today. But as a result of that danger, quite a few Pittsburgh area companies developed safety-related innovations and products to help save lives and reduce injuries. Two such companies are MSA, the Safety Company, and Industrial Scientific. Can you talk about the importance of technology and innovation towards advancing safety in the workplace? And what do you see as a role that the innovation community can, can play in this current crisis and as we move forward? Great, um, thank you for that question. I think it's so important. Um, even before uh, we started addressing COVID, um, it feels like 24 seven, um, we were looking at a lot of um, changes that were being made uh, with computer generated um, control of equipment. So we had our lockout tag out request for information. And mm -hmm. I certainly hope that people took an opportunity to look at that because I think um, our standard is mired in much older technology. And so, you know, we're, we're requiring people to completely turn off the machine and lock it and tag it. And, um, you know, the, the industry is saying, but we can control this energy energization through other means. And so we've had the opportunity to start looking at that and figure out if and how we can update our standards so that we can allow for this um, improved technology that also uh, creates a safer work environment for um, employers and employees. So that's one area that we were looking at um, even before. I think the, um, the increased use of robots and the interaction between people is also another area that is um, very far advanced from what OSHA's regulations are and you know, our regulations envision the robot being very much enclosed, whereas now it's completely, you know, integrated with um, what the worker is doing. So I think there's a lot of innovation that has occurred and um, government regulation uh, designed to protect workers is not quite where, and by not quite, I mean not close, uh, to where the industry is today. And um, yet these innovations have done a lot to protect uh, workers and, and go a long way to solving some of the really um, hazardous pieces of the job. So um, we are committed to examining our rules and regulations and trying to figure out how to update and upgrade them. Um, and I just, and my concern is you all are advancing technology you know, much, much faster than a government rule can be written. Um, but we're examining ways to make that a better process at least. Okay, well, I know we have had more questions. So what we'll do is we will take those questions and send them to you. And if that's okay, okay we can maybe get some yep. answers. But I wanna thank you for taking the time. I know this is a very, Ooh. very hectic time for you more so than usual. So thank you for your leadership. <laughs> thank you so much for your leadership. Really appreciate that on behalf of all of our membership here. And uh, tomorrow it, at the same time, we have Sam Ryman and who runs the RK Mellon Foundation and just put together a $15 million fund to help those in crisis and build our economy as we move forward. So we're very lucky for the philanthropy that we have. And uh, just stay tuned. I want everyone to have a great day. Stay safe. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.